Over the last few weeks, we've looked at the church and we've looked at this idea that church should look like our family table. And I was thinking this morning that that for lunch today, we're going to be sitting around a family table and that family table inevitably will have people who aren't normally at that family table joining in, in what we do at a family table, because people are often sitting at our family tables that aren't from our family. Why? Because it's an open space where people can kick their legs under, can sit back and can relax and become like family. We also discovered that churches that keep their young people are like family. The other thing that we've been harping on about is that we need a five-to-one ratio of adults to kids, so that is adults that know an individual child's name, in order to increase the likelihood of around 35% of that child staying in church. That is backed up by Cara Powell, by Chuck Clark, by multiple other studies that are out there that have shown that that law sort of influence makes a kid feel like that church is like a family. And I'm going to suggest that if you're an adult, how does it feel when people in our church family know your name? Does it feel good? Yeah. When I chatted with, with some of our older people who visit them, they say it just feels good to be named on Sabbath. To say, hey, hello, such and such, how are you going? To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. But this week, we're going we're gonna to park all of those ideas, and we're going to apply them to our church. The family table here at Forest's Beach, what does it look like. If you've got your Bibles there, I encourage you to turn to Joshua chapter 4. And we're going to have a a little glance at Joshua chapter 4, because in Joshua chapter 4, the the Israelites experience something that they've been waiting 40 years for. Any of the uh, senior people in our church, can you tell me how long it took from the idea to the building of Forrester's Beach Church? Was that 20-something years? That's a long time to wait, isn't it? So how long had the Israelites waited to cross over the Jordan? Around 40 years they'd waited for this promised day, right? And so we get here to Joshua chapter 4, and and here in Joshua chapter 4, we see that all the signposts that they've been given have led to this moment. And in Joshua chapter 3, God says to the Israelites, take up the Ark of the Covenant and you're going to go and you're going to place your feet into the Jordan. When you place your feet into the Jordan, the Jordan is going to well up and dry up on either side and you will walk through on dry land and you'll cross over the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. And once the whole nation of Israel has passed over, the Levites would walk out with the Ark of the Covenant and what happened to the Jordan? It would flow once more. And so they cross over the Jordan. In in Joshua chapter 4, there's this command to build what's called a memorial stone. A memorial stone. Now, let's have a a look, and we're going to jump all the way through to verse 21, where it says, saying to the Israelites, having built these 12 memorial stones, when your children ask their parents in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we crossed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So the command came out. The leaders of each of the 12 tribes find a stone and we're going to build these memorial stones to remember what the Lord has done for us. I'm going to suggest that if you look around on the four walls that we have in here, that's a pretty good memorial stone to show what the Lord has done for Forest's Beach Church to bring us to today. This building is a pretty good signpost to show us that there has been a journey that we have gone on to make it here. We have gone through many leaders. There's many people who who saw a vision, who are no longer worshipping with us, who saw what we could be, and they invested in it. Not just with their time, but with their skills and with their money. 
I'll ask you another big question and feel free to get involved. Why did we have a vision to build this church? Anyone, anyone have any, any answers? Why did we have a vision to build Forrester's Beach Church? Was it just so we could have a nice place? No. Was it something more than that? So that we could... Sorry? We needed more space. Okay. If we need more space, we need to grow. We need space so that we can grow and we can be a beacon on the hill. So that we can share God's love with with the central coast more effectively. That's one of the reasons why we're here at Forest's Beach is so that we can be effective stewards of God's mission. That's a very very technical term, right? But we can can look after God's mission and do it well to Bado Bay, to Forest's Beach, to the entrance, to Erina, to our area of influence. That's what this memorial stone, this building, is here for. The stories that form our church family are like markers pointing us in the direction we need to head. And I'm sure if I sat you down and and sat with you, and I've already done that as well, you will have stories to share of how God has led us to where we are. As I speak with Pastor Russell, he shares many an occasion where he just wasn't sure if we were going to make it, right? And yet there were always people to step up to help us make it, to get there, that God's mission is going to happen. Those stories, they tell us not just where we've been, but they help us to know where we're going. Anyone know what this is? What would you call that? Yeah, Rand, I knew Randall was going to answer it. So I'm going, I'll come back to you in a moment, Randall. A can. Now, if you've ever been hiking you will see these around the place, usually on the summit or as a bit of a marker, a navigational marker to say that you're headed on the right direction. And cans have been and are used for a broad variety of purposes. In prehistory, many a long time ago, they were there as markers, as memorials and as burial monuments. In the modern era, we usually use them as landmarks, especially to mark the summits of mountains or somewhere that's really important. Uh, many a time when I've been out regaining on a Pathfinder expedition, inevitably there's a can somewhere nearby, and you're just looking, right? And then you know the marker is 12 wherever it is in a tree, and you find it. But it is a way for us to know that we are in the right spot. Is this many cans helpful? That's on the Captain Cook Highway I discovered. That many cans is not helpful, right? You'd, you'd be a bit lost, not sure if you've made it to the, to the right spot, if there was this many monuments for us to try and work out. So we need clarity, right? We need it to be clear that this is where we are meant to be. That's what these memorial stones that Israel had built were for. To say to Israel that we are headed and we are where we are meant to be. And because we are headed in the right direction, we will tell stories to our children. We will tell stories to the people that join our community so that we can share the gospel with all people. So what's our current story? There's many stories of success here in our church family. We're in a beautiful building. We're a growing church community. There's warmth present in our community and each week in the conversations we have. Our prayer ministry is praying for people and we're seeing answers to prayer. Mercy Bull, she's made it, right? An answer to prayer. There's so many situations that I've seen where there's answers to prayer. Pastor Glynn is here with us this morning. Answers to prayer. We see answers to prayer every single week, and I see answers to prayer as we, as we sit down and we plan. I see God answering prayers. Our families are present, and if our families aren't present, they're busy on pathfinders, they're busy in adventurers, they're busy with school choirs. They're busy doing faith together. God has clearly had his hand over our church as we have journeyed and run many outreach programs, our community groups. Our health programs, our collaboration with other churches here on the Central Coast. As I look across the history of our church, 
I can see that God has utilized many leaders, many pastors, many members to bring us to where we are today. Yet this isn't the end of the journey. We have to ask ourselves a question. What's next? What are we going to do next? It's all well and good to talk about how God has been leading us, right? Because He has been. But if we don't stop and say, what's next? There's no point to what we're doing. We need a direction. We need to choose something that is going to be our core purpose as we move forward. We need to choose things that are going to guide us as we share God's love to the central coast. We need memorial stones or markers to make sure, or cans, to make sure that we've made it or we are headed in the right direction. So together, I'm not going to tell you what's next, by the way, right now, because together we are creating the story of what's next. And I was speaking with a mentor of mine and and I was speaking about the process that we've been on and he, he he shared a nugget of wisdom with me which was between the clarity of where you have been and the clarity of where you are going is confusion and chaos. But when you get over here, oh boy, that feels really good to see the journey that you've been on. So it's going to be maybe a little bit confusing at times. might be unsure. It might be a little bit chaotic at times as we work out where we're headed. But let me tell you, when we stand there with clarity, that's going to feel pretty good and the, and we're going to see the holy spirit launch us into the future 